uh, just a bit of background of me, I work at the National History Museum on a, a welcome funded project looking at um, um, ancient DNA from British skeletons, um, pretty much from Paleolithic up until more or less uh, modern day. And I was originally trained as an, uh, an archaeological science and as a, a human uh, osteologist, and that's how I got uh, the job there. Um, so yeah, archaeology and nationalism, obviously there's a, there's a long history of uh, archaeology, or archaeological um, uh, results being misappropriated by uh, nationalistic organisations, usually to do with uh, aspects of either national myth-making or uh, more around um, uh, things that relate to the idea of blood and soil, that there is uh, an kind of indigenous biological signature that, that is cultivated in a particular a nation or a particular area of the world. Um, that, that needs to be uh, preserved. And um, in the modern day, uh, a lot of nationalist organisations use the kind of language of the UN surrounding indigenous groups, uh, uh, Aboriginal Australians, about an indigenous European peoples that needs to be protected from uh, what they would regard to be genocide as a result of, a po in their view, policies of mass migration that, in their eyes, dilute uh, 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 down uh, the genome. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, that's that bit. Um, and uh, um, DNA studies, particularly modern DNA, but also of ancient DNA, have also been um, misappropriated in this way over the years. So these two books, in particular, uh, Seven Daughters of Eva, Brian Sykes, and The Origins of the British, by Stephen Oppenheimer. Um, both of these uh, books look mostly at modern DNA, looking at, at mitochondrial DNA, particularly. So mitochondrial DNA is. Uh, indicative of maternal ancestry, so it's, it's quite informative relative to other parts of the genome because it doesn't recombine, so it essentially gives a signature all the way up the, ma the maternal line, so mother's, 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 mother, and also Y chromosome um, 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 uh, data from, from modern DNA, which, which is obviously the inherited from the male all the way down the male line. So those, because they, they don't recombine and you've got a signature of um, maternal and paternal ancestry, it's slightly more informative than looking at uh, or other uh, parts of the genome in terms of ancestry and they use this to uh, look at relationships between different populations and both of these concluded that there was, as Penelope mentioned in the, the last talk, that there was a persistent British genome that has persisted there in Britain from the end of the life, last ice age up until um, modern times. And um, this was a, a result that was appropriated quite often by uh, nationalist uh, organisations, particularly in, in Britain where um, uh, it, it was included on all of um, the, the websites, on the BNP website, featured prominently for a long time in the, in the noise. And then um, even if you watch back at the, Nick Griffins, the ex-leader of the BNP, his uh, perf um, famous um, performance on Question Time, he actually cites that on that programme specifically and talks about uh, an indigenous uh, British peoples. So the past few years has been a, a big... A big um, advances in uh, uh, techniques of ancient DNA. So um, previous methods like PCR are looking at pulling out very tiny but informative pieces of the genome uh, to look at. Um, and then one of the main problems with using methods like this is that it was very difficult to control contamination and because you want to get in very small or albeit informative parts of the genome, you, it was very limited to what you, was, uh, what you could actually uh, say. But now we've moved on to um, the new technology, which is next generation sequencing, where it literally pulls out all of the sequences within a sample and sequences everything. Uh, so what you get is much more information rich, and importantly, you get information from the entire genome. So you get essentially a sample of that, all, all of the, those persons, that person's uh, ancestors. Uh, and not only that, but it also allows you to control from contamination. So the, the results that you, we've started getting out of ancient DNA studies in the past five years or so, are so much more informative, so much we can be so much more confident about them, um, and it's, it's kind of revolutionised uh, uh, the field. So all the, the stuff in the, in the initial period about problems with the contamination, trying to get field archaeologists to excavate in hazmat suits, all that sort of with modern contamination um, from digs, whatever, from people handling remains, is no longer really an issue in, in, in ancient DNA. It, it, it just doesn't turn up that often. Um, and so uh, uh, over a hundred. Uh, uh, European human remains have now been sequenced and had the whole genome sequenced from, from, from all over Europe. And this is from uh, around well, 40,000 years ago to the present day. Uh, well, mostly looking at prehistory. And um, what this suggests is that white Europeans or um, European people are essentially defined by 
a series of uh, migrations into Europe and mixing of different populations. So um, around uh, after <coughs> the last glacial maximum, there's this remnant population that that's, uh, survives um, from, from before the last glacial maximum. Um, and that population is mostly replaced uh, around 14,500 years ago by a migration of people from the Near East. After that, uh, when the uh, Neolithic arrives, that's a, uh, also accompanied by another migration of people from, again from the Near East, which um, largely defines, uh, largely um, shifts the population uh, again. And then uh, around 4,500 years ago, the genetics in Europe shifts again, and you get a uh, um, uh, the people that ultimately derive from the Black Sea uh, coming into Europe and start to dominate the uh, genetics there. So all modern European um, populations are a mixture of these three, uh, these three populations, and that varies a lot um, whether in northern southern Europe, which, which sort of reflects the interactions between popula these populations uh, in different places. Um, and what's also interesting. That from this is the, the phenotypic changes that you get, so the changes in, in appearance. So those first hunter gatherers, it seems like from the information we've got so far, there hasn't been that many that have been genotyped. Uh, but from the information that we've got so far, essentially what it seems though that the uh, hunter gatherers that are there in Ice Age Europe, uh, that are there after the last Ice Age, they, they would have been uh, had darker skin, dark hair, and um, uh, dark eyes. Uh, and this hunter gatherer population that comes in around 40,000 years ago. And, uh, most of the places though it seems to have again had dark skin, uh, dark hair, but then blue eyes. And that's when sort of pale eyes seems to have been, or pale eye colour, seems to have been introduced into Europe, completely separate of pale skin and things like blonde hair, things that we associate with that now. And it's not until the Neolithic with the migration of people from the Near East where pale skin or light skin becomes a predominant phenotype in Europe. That actually that in terms of that as a predominant trait, that uh, doesn't happen in Europe until until the Neolithic, and it's spread by migrants from the the Near East in, uh, into Europe. Um, so the, the the idea that the kind of European ideal of, of of an individual with pale skin, pale eyes, maybe even blonde hair, but all of these traits actually were developed outside, uh, mostly kind of developed outside of Europe, and then were kind of spread in as a result of migration and uh, a cultural change. So clearly, the idea of an indigenous uh, genome of any European really is. Um, is a, is, a, is, a bit, is a complete fallacy, really, uh, when you take this into account. But it's funny just how little, even with the, I mean, admit that the results are still quite new, but how little the na nationalists talk, the, the talk about these things on websites, in particular on social media, have just completely ignored this. And this is these kind of results. And this is indicative of, 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 of how they misappropriate uh, results that come out, in that um, they will just use the things that fit their narrative, and they will use, it doesn't matter what the actual overall results are, they will pick out the bits that they like, and they will use it to, uh, to build their narratives. I mean, even if Stephen Oppenheimer was proven right and there was a continuous British genome from the Ice Age, I mean, it, it's irrelevant, because where do you draw the line and when, when the British genome starts? Is it, why is it just at the end of the last Ice Age? You know, if you follow this back to its logical conclusion, you know, the Neanderthals were the first uh, kind of human, well, amongst the first humans to call the were here before us, and, you know, the highest proportion of Neanderthal ancestry now is in East Asia, so does that mean that East Asian populations are really the heirs to Europe. You know, it's like it's, it's a completely logical fallacy to have this kind of "we were here first um, argument anyway. And also, the idea of ancestry um, is um, is a bit misunderstood anyway. So, so a good illustrative example of this is um, Danny Dyer appearing on um, "Who Do You Think You Are" um, the other week and um, finding out that um, Thomas Cromwell was his 15 times great grandfather. And a lot of the program was about, I don't know, seeing them exploring the meaningfulness of, of that kind of um, relationship. Um, I, I, just a naive calculation of how many other, of how many other 15 times great grandfather fathers Danny Dyer must have had, just by a simple extrapolation of you know two, um, two, two, suggests that there was a, or, or he has 131,072 other ones. So. It's probably not that, uh, like 15 times great grandfather, it's probably not that many because what you get is um, um, s certain individuals would have been his great, great, 15 times great grandfather several times over because of just the inbreeding. Also, there'd have been a lot of people in Europe that would uh, uh, make up uh, that number. But what, what it really shows is that the idea of ancestry and lineage is always, in a biological sense, shallow. So all of these narratives are always really rooted in social ideals 
not uh, not related to um, biology at all, really. Um, What's funny, I mean, you, you, so you consider that, you consider the, so the, 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 there's, there's a famous quote now um, that essentially, if you're a European living in the ninth century and you produce descendants, you are the ancestor of every European that's alive today. So, we you know the, the, the age-old question of, oh, am I related to Charlemagne? If you basically, if you have pale skin, you are related to Charlemagne, you are directly descended from Charlemagne, because that's just how ancestry works with the um, sort of exponential increase of ancestors as you go back in time. Uh, but again, this, um, this is not something that, well, is, is really widely understood in terms of ancestry, which might come back to these ideas of experts, because it often comes with ideas about what people feel intuitively compared to what is factually. Intuitively, you've got an idea that, obviously, the, the ancestry, even when you're going back, uh, ancestry, that there is a, sort of a significance, biological significance to ancestry in, in history. But the, the, the science shows that biologically it's, it's kind of meaningless. But this isn't, um, has been taken on board by the nationalists so much, again, showing how they incorporate things into the narrative. So the, the, the thing that they have seized upon more recently is um, this study, People of the British Isles, where they uh, sequenced the genomes of modern people and uh, looked for structure. And what they found was that um, th this was being used by... Uh, the Breitbart website, uh, journalists on the Breitbart website, the kind of uh, right-wing website that was partly responsible for kind of the Trump campaign and things, um, to kind of justify saying that the British peoples are thousands of years old. Um, I mean, it's interesting because the actual results suggest that this red area here, that that that, with that kind of genetic structure that you can see here, which is split between the different um, areas of Britain, that was produced by the Anglo-Saxons. So they're kind of undermining it that as a result of the migration of the Anglo-Saxons. So they're kind of undermining their own argument there. But also the fact that, uh, also the fact that um, um, uh, there was sort of, and then all the other genomes they suggested went back to the Ice Age. So like the and anything that isn't red essentially is it goes back to Ice Age structure, which, which wasn't asserted in this paper really, and it's a bit ridiculous anyway. And to be honest, looking at the motley nature of the differences in these structure, um, uh, so under, again undermines the argument because it's clearly quite different, potentially different populations at, at play here, and it can't just be that much difference just from um, one <laughs> migration into uh, Britain after the Ice Age. But what's also important about this study is it's just stupidly conservative. So the they wanted to get a, a pre-industrial idea of, um, of, um, of the genetics of Britain. So they actually purposely took people whose grandparents lived within 80 miles of one another from rural locations and whose average date of, I think, birth was 1885. So what you've got here is kind of a pre-industrial <coughs> signature. So it's because what they were trying to look for this kind of deep structure. So it, it, it's artificially conservative because they, they weren't looking at modern Britons. It says no real um, application to the genetic structure in modern Britain. It would just be a complete mass of a, of a blur. But what this was to it was exploring population changes in the past by using this data. So it's completely inappropriate to use this. But again, sort of feeds into this idea of uh, appropriate and these things. So what's this got to do uh, with archaeology? Um, I mean, clearly, whilst, whilst uh, I use this in another talk, it's just a quite quick bit of uh, the, um, you know, uh, nationalists really exist, or sort of perceive this politically quite on the fringe of things at the moment. But I think that, uh, that their influence is growing a lot more kind of on social media. And, um, and so, so it's like pushing certain ideas about like indigenous British genomes that events can build up into sort of more of a collective consciousness if it's not really um, combated. So um, I think uh, um, th there is kind of a threat out there, really. There's a, there's a threat out there, and, and I think Arco is the best place to take it on because because we can be such much more confident about the um, results of studies now. Uh, we can very much more ground them, take them and ground them in the archaeology and show how this is relevant to local people. Because talking about genes in an abstract way isn't particularly engaging, but if you can take those results of genetic studies, link them to archaeological sites and explain that, that can counteract the, uh, the appropriation of, of, of genetic results by sort of nationalist uh, ideologies. And in the same vein, um, we... Uh, I, I, I've used this term before, and um, we're often encouraged to use the term our, our ancestors because it's, it's supposed to be a way of in, uh, uh, engaging people. But I really don't like, uh, even though I've used it in the past, 
I don't like the line of assumption that people will be more engaged in history if they feel they have a genetic stake in it. Because not only is that show that that's ludicrous um, in, in a general sense when you get back, so when you get back to the Neolithic, the fact that you know the, the, the people that would be responsible for the majority of British ancestry would be living somewhere near the, the Black Sea. And actually, by the time we get to that point, um, everybody alive today would be descended from any individual that passed on their ancestors just because of how we go back. So it becomes a redundant phrase. And I think that when we talk about our ancestors, people think we're talking specifically about if we have an Anglo-Saxon site and talk about ancestors. People say that, um, think that we're talking about specifically British ancestors. When Do they know when we're talking about the 9th century that when we talk about our ancestors, we're talking about ancestors of all Europeans? And I don't think they do. And I think that allows... Um, uh, I think that, that plays into hands of, 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 of nationalist ideals based upon uh, and nationalist narratives based upon ancestry, when really it, it's, it, uh, the narratives in the past have nothing to do with ancestry, it's kind of a redundant thing, it's all about a place, a sense of place, and things happening in a particular place, and I'll just leave the conclusions to uh, suit themselves. <laughs>